may ask some of your colleagues here on campus, you may ask them, why do you come to the university? And they will honestly reply to you, hmm, just because they say, hmm, you should not assume is hmm. There are reasons for them coming here. There are forces which have forced them here, which they may be unaware of. The world needs more conscious men and women. A conscious man, a conscious woman, is someone who tries to understand and understands the reason for all their acts. I am a revolutionary. The world needs revolutionaries, <laughs> desperately. As a revolutionary, I try not only to understand the reason for the act, I try to effectuate the reason for the act, therefore taking self-determination in my own hands. There's a reason then for me coming here this evening. The reason is in line with the essence of man. We know, we know that the essence of life is service to humanity. Of this, there is no question. We know that the service, that the essence of life is service to humanity. Of this, there is no question. Any man, any woman, who comes from an oppressed people must instinctively know that in order to live up to their responsibility to humanity, they must every minute of their lives be struggling for the liberation of the masses of their people. We say the world needs conscious men. We say the needs, world needs conscious women. We're here for a reason. As we look around the world, we find the African masses disorganized. We understand that the root of all the problem is because of this disorganization, no other reason. Others will give us a million reasons as to why, but this is the root cause, we are disorganized. It is a prerequisite that in order to be liberated, one must be organized. That is to say, organization is a prerequisite for liberation, clearly. Since our people must be free, and they will only be free when we're organized, we are here in this effort to continue in the process of organizing the masses of our people. We come together among the African students here, the most intelligent, the most serious, the most dedicated, those who are not confused by the capitalist system, those who understand that they have a responsibility to help alleviate the sufferings of the masses of their people. We come to get those, we ask them at the end, you will find a table in the back with a sign-up list. We would like you to come and help organize us, organize the masses of our people. We repeat, our people are disorganized. It is only through organization that we will be liberated. We cannot be liberated without organization. Therefore, we must come to struggle only as an organized force. As a matter of fact, the enemy which we're up against, this capitalist system, it is a permanent organization, and it seeks to make itself more permanent. And it is an organization. If we come seriously to struggle against without organization. Therefore, we must come to struggle only as an organized force. As a matter of fact, the enemy which we're up against, this capitalist system, it is a permanent organization, and it seeks to make itself more permanent. And it is an organization. If we come seriously to struggle against it, we must struggle against it within organizational network, not as individuals, not as an ad hoc committee, but as a permanent revolutionary force. It's the only answer. We come to struggle against the capitalist system. In doing so, we hope to raise the consciousness of our people. We hope to raise the consciousness of those to become more responsible to their people. And those who are more conscious, we wish to make them even more conscious so they will come forward and help organize the masses of the people. When a people are unfree, Seeking to be free is very easy. All they have to do is live the truth. It's very simple. All people should live the truth. Of course, 
the enemy, the capitalist system, it will confuse us as to one, what the truth is, two, how to find the truth, and three, after having found the truth, it will seek to tell, it will seek to undermine our will to live the truth. But we say when a people want to be free, they must live the truth. They must come to know about the truth and how to find the truth. We say from the very beginning that the truth is objective. The truth is not at all subjective. A few days ago, I met one of our little sisters on a college campus. She had fried her hair. I said to her, my sister, you shouldn't fry your hair. She said to me, I like it this way. Said, well, we shouldn't give people everything they like. Dope addicts like dope. The clan likes rope. We shouldn't give people everything they like. <laughs> <laughs> she looked back and she said to me, I think I look good this way. I said, well, at this time in the world, the question of beauty is a subjective question. And seeing that we live in a racist society, I can understand why you fry your hair. She backed off again. She said, I don't care what you say, I like it this way and it's the truth to me and what's the truth to me is the truth. And that's where we stopped. You know, my sister, the truth is not inside anyone. The truth is outside each and every one of us. It is only when we come to understand the objective nature of the truth that we can understand the egalitarian nature of the truth. The truth is outside each and every one of us. Therefore, each and every one of us can come to know it and live it. The truth is not inside anyone. We say the truth is objective. So objective is the truth that the majority cannot give you the truth. We are not confused when people talk about the silent majority. The majority of Germans were Nazis under Hitler. The majority cannot give you the truth. The truth is independent of all men and women. So objective is the truth we say the majority can't give it to you. A few years ago, the majority of people in Europe thought the world was flat. They thought it. They ordered their lives around the concept of the flatness of the world. One man. A man by the name of Malagellan, he came along and said, hey y'all, the world's not flat. Malagellan, he was talking based on his investigation. The other people, they were saying the world was flat because the king said the world was flat. You know, just like today Carter says, go to Afghanistan. People say, go to Afghanistan? <laughs> yes. Malagellan, one man, he came along and said, hey, it's not flat. They said, Malagellan, don't you go out there, you get hurt. They were discussing. Malagellan, he left them discussing. He went and he got in a ship. He started here. He went like this. He came back here. Discussion was over. <laughs> the truth is theory put into concrete action. The truth is theory put into concrete action. We find the truth by stripping ourselves of all sentimentality, by stripping ourselves of all emotion. We find the truth by using the scientific method. We observe. We post hypotheses, we test, we get conclusions, end of discussion. Yes, sir. We say, <laughs> we say when a people want to be free, they must live the truth. And we underline the objective nature of the truth. The truth is so objective, a man or a woman may be involved in a process, think they understand the process, and have no comprehension of the process at all. We say the truth is so objective that a man or a woman may be involved in a process, contribute their energies to this process, thinking they understand it and having no comprehension of it at all. History abounds with examples. A few years ago, African youth born in this country, suffering under this racist capitalist system. White youth born in this country, also suffering under this capitalist system. Indian youth born in this country, suffering under this genocidal capitalist system. They went to Vietnam with guns in hands. Some believed they were fighting for democracy. Some believed they were fighting for freedom. Some died thinking they were fighting for the truth, when the truth is they were fighting for the interests of selfish capitalist pigs in this country against humanity, against the Vietnamese, and consequently against their very selves. The truth we say is objective. Objective. We say the truth is objective, and we say that when we come to struggle, we must come to struggle to see the truth. 
And we come to tell you the truth. Once a man, once a woman knows the truth, they must not let bullets shake them from the truth. The truth is that our people will not be free until the capitalist system is destroyed. The truth is our people gonna be free, therefore the capitalist system is going to be thoroughly and completely destroyed. Completely destroyed. Completely destroyed. Now, we come then to wage struggle against this capitalist system. We come to say that in order for a people to be free, they must be thinking rigorously and critically at every minute of their lives. And we come to say that in a capitalist system, the only way they can be thinking rigorously and critically every minute of their lives is when every minute of their lives they're involved in a constant struggle against the capitalist system. And for her, the question of learning is only a question of struggling. The question of learning is only a question of struggling. It is only through struggling with the capitalist system that one becomes to understand it clearer and see more precisely the manner in which to completely destroy it. Therefore, for us in our party, the underline is struggle, nothing else but struggle. And, the str and it must be struggled with. The capitalist system, it seeks to confuse the people. As a system based on exploitation, it understands the best way to exploit the people is to keep them confused. The best way to keep them confused is to let them think that everybody else is confused and they're the only ones not confused. <laughs> and, and, and examples abound. Look, if you will look at these pimps of journalism who come to support the capitalist system, when they, what today is the 174th, 35, 6, what? 176 days. Every day they got a story, these pimps. If you will listen to them carefully, they make it appear as if the people of Iran are divided and confused under the question of the hostages. One day they make it appear as if the students are losing power, the moderates are gaining, or the fanatics are back in power. It'll be free tomorrow. In two weeks they keep lying to the people, confusing the people. The Iranian people may be confused on many issues. They may be divided on many issues, but one issue they're not divided on, one issue they're not confused about is the hostages. They said the hostages were staying there until the Shah returned. End of discussion. End of discussion. These pimps of journalism in coming now to confuse the people will talk about everything except the Shah. <laughs> yes, yes, you must be alert. 24 hours a day you must be struggling with it because its job is to confuse the people. The capitalist system understands that the masses of the people love justice. Not only do they love it, they struggle for it. Everywhere the people love justice. Oh, we can just see that by taking a cursory look at history. If we look at the beginnings of societies, we will see that every society, isolated from every other society, created religions in every society. Though the forms of these religions may vary, and in their particular form, they vary widely. But if one looks through the varying particular forms, one will find through religions running a common universal thread, the love of justice. The people love justice so much that everywhere they create religions. Not only do they create religions, they create gods everywhere. And these gods are just gods. The people love justice so much that they believe if they cannot have it while they're on the face of the earth, at least when they die, they must have justice and their god must punish those who were bad and reward those who were good. The people love justice. Yes. And the capitalist system knows it. It comes to confuse the people. What the capitalist system does is it wants the people to think they're thinking when in fact they are not thinking. And what it does is that it presents the people with choices, alternatives. The people choose between the alternatives. In choosing between the alternatives, the people think they have thought. <laughs> I'll tell you, they, listen, they don't want the people to think now. All they want them to do is to respond to stimuli, that's all. As a matter of fact, if you want to see how much they don't want you to think, just to respond to stimuli. Do you know that when you check your IQ in this country, you check it through multiple choice? <laughs> They don't want you to think so much that they will give you A, B, C, D, and E. A will be dog, B will be cat, C will be fish, D will be horse. Don't worry. 
If it's none of these, you don't have to think. He will say, none of the above. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> They don't want them to think, just to respond to stimuli. And in responding, they think they're intelligent. Scientifically speaking, I can guess my way through the IQ test and be a genius. Of course. Of course, because here there's no thinking. Watch how they do it. They will come before the people and they say, choose between Kennedy and Carter. And the people will go. And they will listen to Carter. And they will listen to Kennedy. And they will read what Carter says, and they will read what Kennedy says, and they will analyze, and they will even ask that they debate, and maybe they will come and debate, and the people will look and listen to them debate, and after the people will think they have thought and thought and thought, they will go and choose between Carter and Kennedy. <laughs> <laughs> Not only does it get, but think this, the capitalist system, it gives you a choice on the same side of the coin, not the other side. <laughs> and not only that, once it gives the people a chance to choose, it gives them only a one-sided view of history such that they don't even look at the other side. And if you try to come and tell them to look at the other side, they accuse you of being treacherous, trying to brainwash them. Let me give you an example. The capitalist system will come to the people and say, choose between, choose between communism and democracy. Well, the people love justice. Democracy has connotations of justice, so instinctively they choose democracy. We say the capitalist system will give them a one-sided view of history such that once they have chosen democracy, thinking they have already thought, they don't even look back at communism. And if you come to tell them, hey, you ought to know what communism is, get away from me, you're trying to brainwash me. Yes, yes. They become arrogant in their ignorance. Now, once they are here at this point, the capitalist system has them exactly where it wants them. We said they think they've thought all they've done is chosen, reacted to stimuli. And now once they've chosen, they don't look back. They've thought once and for all. When the capitalist system needs them, when it wants to wage wars of plunder, it comes before the people and yells, hey, our democracy is threatened. Communism is coming. The people grab guns. Where? Santa Domingo. Who <laughs> No thought. <laughs> Vietnam. <laughs> Afghanistan. Let's be serious. Come on. <laughs> Yes. Even if the people were to take a serious look, they could see one cannot choose between communism and democracy. Communism is an economic system. Democracy is a characteristic of an economic system. One doesn't choose between woman and pretty. <laughs> there are only two economic systems in the world. Only two. Capitalism and socialism leading to communism. There are but two. No one sitting in this audience tonight can name me another. Others tell us that there's another. Some even tell us that they're working on a third. Fine, while you are working on number three, we know there are only two. Capitalism or socialism leading to communism. Either one is for capitalism or one is for socialism. It's as simple as that. As simple as that. As simple as that. But the capitalist system will so confuse the people that they're living under a capitalist system and they think they're living under democracy. <laughs> we say democracy is a characteristic of, a, of an economic system. Even under cattle slavery, the most brutal form of capitalism, here one has no freedom of democracy. Under serfdom, there's some democracy. You can leave the land once in a while. Under capitalism, there are illusions of bourgeois democracy. And that's what confuses them. The capitalist system now, we say it doesn't want them to think. It just wants them to think they're thinking. It seeks to make them lazy. It seeks to make them not want to read and to analyze, just to accept the alternatives posed to them by the capitalist system. Do you know, just between you and I, if you took a poll of the African students on this campus, I will bet you 75% of them have never read one book by Martin Luther King. In addition to that, I will bet you 65% of them cannot name the titles of three books or four books that he wrote. And I will also bet you that when a discussion on the 60s come, they're the first one with the loudest mouth. <laughs> Capitalism, it makes them arrogant in their ignorance. <laughs> yes, I say we have struggle to do, we have struggle, we have struggle. Our people must be free. Our people can only be free through conscious struggle. We make it clear, the people struggle unconsciously. We demonstrated how the man goes to Vietnam unconsciously, thinking he's fighting for good when actually fighting for bad. So too, a person can unconsciously struggle for a good cause. 
As a matter of fact, we say instinctively the people struggle for justice. It's innate to humanity. Understand our statement. We say instinctively the people struggle for justice. What must be done is that they must be made conscious of their struggle. What must be done is that they must be made conscious of their struggle. History is a guide to future action. History is a guide to future action. If one doesn't know one's history, one cannot take future action. If one doesn't understand who one is and what one's interests are, one will never be able to struggle properly. As a matter of fact, one will always struggle for the interest of others. That's why we're always on the front lines in Vietnam and Korea, fighting for everybody's interest except our own. History. history is crucial. History is crucial. We say without history, you can't make future action. Our people are confused. This capitalist system, it doesn't play. It doesn't play. It's serious about what it wants to do. It decided, when it decided to steal Africans, that when it brought Africans to America, those Africans in America must come to hate Africa, must come not to want to identify with Africa, must come to understand that Africa means nothing to them. And if you're not careful, it just might succeed. I mean, it has done such a good job that you take any 10 of us and put us in one room and ask us what we are, and I bet you you get 10 different answers. One to tell you I'm Negro. Another one to tell you I'm colored. Another one to tell you I'm Belalian. Another one to tell you I'm Afro. Another one to tell you I'm American. That's a real crazy one. You got to look closer. <laughs> You have to look close at that one and tell you, well, I got some black foot in me. <laughs> I'm glad you told me I couldn't detect it. <laughs> yes. Another one to tell you I'm African American. One to tell you I'm black American. Another one to tell you I'm African. That's the intelligent one. And the last one to probably tell you I'm unique. <laughs> only for us. Only for us. All the others, they're not confused. All the others, they're not confused. As a matter of fact, we're the only ones we call by color, everybody else by their land. Yeah. You don't call the Japanese yellow. No, you don't. You don't call the Irish green. No, you don't. You don't call the Mexican brown, but you call us black. We're Africans. This confusion is everywhere. Until we know properly our history, we cannot take future steps. I just want to give you an example of how you can become confused with your history. I met a young sister the other day. She came to me talking about women's liberation. She said, what's your party's position on women's liberation? So it's very simple. We're creating a revolutionary women's union inside of our party, which is an independent organization inside the party of sisters. Why? Because sisters have to fight with brothers against capitalism, which is the major enemy, and they have to fight against brothers for the backward attitudes that they have under capitalism towards women. Yes. Yes. Some of the attitudes are bad. Some of the attitudes are so bad that some of our brothers beat sisters. Can you understand that? Can you understand that? I mean, actually beat them. You understand that? Yeah. Uh, we have a struggle here, a serious struggle. Yeah. So, she said, oh no, that's not the problem. She said, you think capitalism is the only problem? I said, that's the only problem. She said, before there was capitalism, there was sexism. Before there was capitalism, there was male domination. I said, you have your history confused. You have your history totally confused. I said, if you're an African woman and you want to solve the problem of equality between African man and African woman, you must do history, first of all. And if you do history, you cannot begin your history in America, because when we came to America, all of us were slaves, clearly. You must go before America. If you do your history only in America, you must accept the model of the family life, the one handed to us by European imperialism, clearly. Now, when you go back to Africa, you see clear. When you go back to Africa, you will see that Africa was the first continent to produce queens in the Bible, Queen of Sheba. <laughs> In the Bible, the Candace of Ethiopia, they don't read. <laughs> they don't read. The very first. And these queens were not honorary positions. They were queens in full position of political power, from Nefertiti to Cleopatra, all the way down to Nzinga, all the way down to Yaya Asante. Yes, everywhere. 
If you would look properly, I told her, you would see that the African continent was the only continent to produce matriarchy as the system that governed the family. The only continent. We're not saying it was the only place. No. In the South Pacific, they developed it in some societies in South America. Even here, before 1492. Before 1492? Yes. <laughs> you know why we must say that? Because the American people, they know a lot about places before 1492. They know something about China before 1492. They know something about Africa before 1492. They know a lot about Europe before 1492. But not only do they not know nothing about here before 1492, they're not even interested in finding out. <laughs> Capitalism, they don't whoop you. <laughs> Well, the reason they don't want to find out is because if you find out, there might be some contradictions as to who owns the land. <laughs> if you don't ask before 1492, the question is finished. Columbus discovered it. <laughs> yes. It's rough, this capitalism. If you would look at, there's an uh, anthropologist, his name is Morgan. He did some research. He found matriarchy, too, on the, among the Indians here, the American Indians, before European imperialism. We said that she is confused because matriarchy is a system of perfect equality between man and woman. So much so that even the inheritance passes through the woman. Yet here, there was no patriarchal. Patriarchal systems were introduced to Africa from the outside and were in constant struggle against the matriarchal system. And we say it was continental wide. One sees it from Nefertiti all the way down to Yaya Santi. And wherever one looks, one finds the African woman on the front lines. We see Nzinga on the front lines fighting against the Portuguese. In the 19th century, we see Yaya Santi on the front lines fighting against the British in Ghana. So everywhere they're on the front lines in America, we see Rosa Parks, we see Fannie Lou Hamer, we see Gloria Richardson, we see, oh, come on, Angela Davis, come on, come on. But if she's not careful, she will take the history of others and make this her history and come up with the incorrect solution to her problem. History is important. I want to use one aspect of history just to show you that if one doesn't properly understand one's history, how confused one can be. It is to be understood. The job of the capitalist system is to make us lazy, not to make us want to analyze, to in fact give us the analysis and have us accept it. If you look at this pig system, when it gets through with Martin Luther King, packaging him and throwing him out here, he looks like a fat, chubby minister with a Bible under his arm, eating a chicken bone. That's the way they think. King was rough. King was rough. King put them in so much trouble, they had to kill him, you understand? Because King would bring the people out in the street and turn the country upside down, all in the name of Jesus Christ. <laughs> It was rough. It was rough. These people will tell us that history repeats itself. Nothing repeats itself. Nothing can repeat itself. If I'm the greatest singer in the world, I'm Otis Redding, and I come before you and I sing respect, and I have the baddest musicians with me, and I sing it the best way I can. And as soon as I'm finished, I start again, and I sing it the exact same way, and the musicians play the same way. It cannot be a repetition, because if nothing else, time has changed. <laughs> and once that one is gone, everything. History doesn't repeat itself. We can repeat mistakes. We can repeat mistakes. A people who do not analyze and study their history are a people who are doomed to repeat it. And if we as a people do not study our history, certainly we'll be repeating errors and don't even know we're repeating them. As a matter of fact, the enemy will encourage you to repeat them. Yes. And this is what is done every day. We want to use two examples. We want to use Dr. King and Malcolm X. When I use King and X, I don't use them as individual heroes, no. I use them only as people who reflect the ideas of a great segment of the masses of our people. I know that one man cannot free the people. I know that we don't need leaders. I know what we need is organization, so I'm not confused. So when I use King and Malcolm, I don't use them as one man who can free the people. It can't be done. No one man can free the people. If one man can free the people, I'd have done it. <laughs> of course. Of course. <laughs> of course. 
<laughs> they don't think I wait for you, no. Only the people properly organized can free the people. We want to use King and Malcolm just to show how we must trace our history. We want to single King out for a minute because King made a mistake. President Sekou Touré, leader of the African Revolution, president of the People's Revolutionary Republic of Guinea says, the only man that will not make a mistake is a man who does nothing, clearly. Therefore, we as a people must come to look at the mistakes that we've made and correct them. King made a mistake. King confounded the mistake he made because he was an honest man. And by confounding this mistake because he was honest, the capitalist system comes to confound it even more. Now, King was an honest man. Make no mistake about that. And we show that as we speak. King's mistake was a mistake that's made in this country all the time is the confusion between tactic and principle. Well, you see, since the country is a capitalist country, the principle is get money by any means necessary. So when you're killing a man, even though it's tactical, it might be principle because you're getting money. <laughs> There's a confusion between tactics and principles. King came to confuse tactics and principles. King took nonviolent, which was a tactic, and made it a principle. But we said King was an honest man. And King, since, was an, since King was an honest man, he understood that once he had a principle, he couldn't compromise this principle. Thus, once he made nonviolence a tactic, a principle, King was forced to say, the only way we can free ourselves is through nonviolence. Say this is incorrect. Nonviolence is not a tactic, it's a, not a principle, it's a tactic. But the capitalist system confuses. They keep everywhere telling people that nonviolence is the principle. I even heard a stupid man on TV, I mean a stupid man. There ought to be a law against the spreading of stupidity in this country. <laughs> he was out there, the man said, well, your people are having a lot of trouble. She said, yeah, our people are having a lot of trouble. Well, what you going to do? Well, you know what we're going to do. We're going to go back to the 1960s. Go back, nobody goes back in history. History goes forward. And uh, we're going to go back because, you know, the only time we make Success is when there's nonviolence, so that's the answer. Stupid man. Nonviolence is a tactic, not a principle. Even King himself, we could prove it. We'd ask King two questions one tactical, one strategical. King, were you alive in 1861, knowing that the Civil War was imminent, understanding that with the coming of the Civil War would also come the crushing of the institutions of chattel slavery? Would you pose nonviolence or would you be a chaplain in the army? Second question, strategical. King, were you alive when European imperialism came to America? Understanding that its intent was to commit genocide against the red man, would you pose nonviolence? And finally, to those who are still confused, thinking that nonviolence is a principle, we tell you, if you hold to nonviolence as a principle, you must applaud the Jews who marched into the ovens of the Nazis and condemned the Allied forces for using force to destroy Nazism. Nonviolence is a tactic not a principle. If one would just do some cursory reading of it, one would see the man to whom we link the name nonviolence, Mahatma Gandhi, who did the most work on it, he would demonstrate to us better than anybody else that it's a tactic. If you look properly, you would see the first place he tried out nonviolence was in South Africa, Azania. And when he tried it there, there was a man by the name of General Smuts, a fascist pig, and he ran Mohatma Gandhi and his nonviolence right out of Azania into India. It's a tactic. <laughs> it's a tactic. But people will become, they want us to do that, you see. Malcolm X wasn't confused in this area. Malcolm and King wanted the same thing. King, what do you want? I want the liberation of my people. Malcolm, what do you want? I want the liberation of my people. King, what means will you use? The only means we will use is nonviolence. Malcolm, what means will you use? Any means necessary. Yeah, then you can see clearly the mistake. Now, Malcolm made some mistakes against King. And not that I want to belabor the point, but I want to show it out. King, one of the greatest things that I learned from King was that King never attacked anyone, although he was attacked by everyone. Elijah Mohammed attacked him. Malcolm attacked him. Even Roy Wilkins attacked him. Slick attacked him. But King never attacked anyone. Malcolm himself was to learn of this when he came back from Mecca. He was to say, I made a lot of mistakes. I call a lot of people a lot of names. I hope they can forgive me. I've been wrong many times because we need to work for unity. But King never was. King was brutally honest. 
So was Malcolm. As a matter of fact, they killed King because he was so honest. Our line is that Malcolm X was the revolutionary. King was a reformist. But because he was honest, unlike most other reformists, because he was honest, he had to go to revolution, and that's why they killed King. That's our line. Malcolm was an organizer. King was a mobilizer. The difference between an organizer and a mobilizer is that an organizer organizes around ideas. A mobilizer mobilizes around issues. Thus we will see to be an organizer, one must be a mobilizer. But being a mobilizer doesn't make one an organizer. Here the press even comes to confuse us. People will think that in the 1960s, the country was on the verge of revolution. Oof. What revolution? Without organization, how can you have revolution? The best you had in the 60s was mobilization. National mobilization. King was a mobilizer, not an organizer. As a matter of fact, I met a young brother the other day discussing with me, telling me, we missed in the 60s. In the 60s, we had so many leaders. We had no leaders. We had only mobilizers. No, no, King was a leader. King was a national leader. King was an international leader. Tell me what was his organization. King's organization was called the Southern Christian Leadership Conference. That means even in the title, the organization was limited only to the South and not the entire South, only five states in the South. When King came to the North and speak as a mobilizer, he'd mobilize the people. He would put enthusiasm in them. But as soon as he left, it would go down. No organization. Here again, we must be careful. Because the difference between the 60s and the 80s, in the 60s we were mobilized, in the 80s we must be organized.